Individualising patient care in chronic myeloid disorders such as CML and MPN is really critically important. These are conditions that are effectively still, even in 2018, incurable. Our treatments are associated with significant side effects and the conditions themselves, particularly CML for example, is ultimately a progressive condition. So it's really important that we use individual patient data, both at the time of diagnosis, to refine treatment. For CML, that might be about understanding what their risk is and their likelihood of responding and then monitoring their response and escalating or changing therapy going forward. But for MPN, even more, it's about, are we going to watch and wait this patient or are we going to subject them to a treatment that won't ultimately cure them and it might cause them significant ongoing toxicity. So it's really about looking at what the risks are for that individual patient and then taking a risk benefit assessment almost at every time point in their disease and knowing what for that patient is an acceptable risk and what is not. And then managing them also through the individual life events because these patients, although they're average time of diagnosis, or median age at diagnosis will be in their mid-60s, there are still around one in five patients, for example, with ET or PV who are diagnosed under the age of 40. And so, A, these patients are likely to have these diseases for 30 or 40 years, maybe even more, and B, also, we have to be thinking about cumulative toxicity of treatments, either not treating or treating, and that's even true of very simple treatments such as, for example, aspirin. The PT1 study is a very long running study in the UK. It was first launched in 1997, so that's 21 years ago, and it had three arms. And um, the three arms were for high risk patients age over 60 or with a previous thrombosis. We were asking the question, is anagrolide plus aspirin superior to hydroxycarbamide plus aspirin or not? In the lower risk patients aged below 40 without any vascular risk, we were just doing an assessment of what actually happens to those patients in real life. And then the patients in between with no high risk factors, but age over 40 and less than 60, were asking the question, is there a rationale for adding a treatment in preventing thrombosis or in pre preventing transformation. So we were able to answer those clinical questions and in brief the answer is that hydroxycarbamide is superior to anagrolide. That was first um, published in 2005. That uh, there is no rationale for adding hydroxycarbamide to aspirin for patients of, of intermediate risk unless a further clinical event occurs that means that they should be treated. For example, they become hypertensive or diabetic or the platelet count goes up. But beyond that, we've also been able to define and understand a lot more about the basic biology of the disease. So the impact of the study is also enhanced by the fact that we did a lot of sample and data collection. So we're able to understand, for example, how the impact of bone marrow pathology, its interpretation, the variability in its interpretation, the interplay of the different mutations. So for example, in ET, we'd expect around 50% of the patients to have the JAK2 mutation, and we were able to assess the interaction between JAK2 mutated ET and PV, showing that they're very much along a continuum. Then around 30% of patients have the CALAR mutation and we were able to show, for example, that, that for those patients the benefit of hydroxycarbamide if they're high risk is not so great as if they're JAK2 mutators. So we've basically, in this study, been able to perform a very comprehensive analysis of both the basic biology of the disease, the interplay of treatment, whilst following up patients for 20 years or more, which is really important in such a chronic, relatively indolent disease. Looking forward in the next sort of couple of decades, I think there's plenty of scope for progression and improvements for patients with both CML and MPN, but to focus particularly on MPN, because we still don't really have a targeted therapy. And um, several studies have shown, for example, that whilst we're controlling blood counts, we're not really addressing some of the fundamental issues that patients have. So I'd really like to be able to translate further 
scientific research into clinical practice, really be able to individualise treatment, not over-treat patients who don't need treating, be able to use a complex genetic analysis to pick up those patients who are at highest risk and intervene early, but also to be able to have better therapeutic tools, to be able to intervene effectively for patients. At the moment, we're really using very blunt, non-specific agents, and I think there's plenty of scope for these patients who really have quite a high disease burden to be, um, for that to be improved in clinical practice. For me, the BSH is a really critical meeting. It's a fantastic opportunity to not just attend sessions in my own field, but attend sessions in other fields. I've just been in a fantastic Meet the Experts session for ITP. I think the Crucible uh, session was fantastic as well.